This is Love You a Brunch, the show for those who'd rather be brunching. Hi, I'm Jody Stapler. Today I'm speaking to Gail Gand, restaurateur, nationally acclaimed pastry chef, cookbook author, TV personality, teacher, entrepreneur, and mother. Not only do we speak to her about one of her cookbooks, Gail Gann's Brunch, but we also spoke to her about her life, her family, and how she got started in the food industry. So stay with us on Love You a Brunch. I walk the floor. So let's um, get into this. Okay. Uh, feels like we've been trying to do this forever. Yes, congratulations. Uh, we did it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We did have a, a mishap last night. I was a little worried it wasn't going to happen this morning. My 14-year-old likes to cook, and um, he was actually making French fries, and I guess um, when he was draining out, he got French fry grease all over his hand. So this morning, we had to take him to the doctors. Luckily, it had cooled down a little bit, but I was like, oh, no, don't make me cancel again. He, so, could, he but, could practically be a professional chef. That, that happens once to you in your chef life. Yeah, so you you know pour hot oil all or something really important. Uh, uh, so now he's done. He doesn't have to do that. exactly. <laughs> he's you know he out of I have four kids. So out of all of my kids, he's the one that while well, I think it was his eighth birthday, he asked for a waffle maker for his birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so who knows? Good sign or really bad sign? <laughs> exactly. So we'll see. We'll see. So today we are speaking to Gail Gand. Um, you have won numerous awards, including the James Beard Award. Uh, you're a pastry chef, of course, nationally, internationally acclaimed, I'm assuming. Um, you have eight cookbooks under your belt. Of course, you're a TV personality. That's where I first have seen you, Food Network all the way. And um, you teach. You're an entrepreneur. You have many restaurants. And, of course, you're a mother. And you even have your own Gail Gan Day in October. <laughs> That's incredible. So I'd like to get to know you a little bit. Um, I've I you have, right? <laughs> well, a long list. Did you mention that I'm an artisanal root beer maker as well? Oh, that's I've been doing that for 20 years now. That's great. And, you know, I'm, I'm here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, so we're all about homemade root beer. Uh-huh. Um, so I'll have to find some of yours. First <laughs> of all, I read that you had gotten into cooking kind of on accident. Um, you were a waitress, I guess. you want to tell us a little bit about that? So I was a waitress in Cleveland, Ohio, at a vegetarian restaurant. It was called Light of Yoga. And it was my after-school job while I went to art school at the CIA, which is not the Culinary Institute of America that everyone thinks of. When you're in art school, it's the Cleveland Institute of Art. Okay. So an after-school job, I basically took it for the staff meal of it because, you know, you get a free staff meal oh, at yeah. like 4 o'clock. <laughs> So, you know, I was a starving art student, and I thought, well, you know, how can I get some free food? So I started waitressing, and I absolutely loved it. I loved explaining the food to the people. I loved telling them, you know, how it was prepared and what ingredients were in it and, you know, what textures were being combined. And I loved the idea of restoring people. You know, the, the word restaurant comes from the word to restore. Right. So. I took my job very seriously that, you know, my project was to take these downtrodden, hardworking, you know, worn out from the day people and try to restore them back to their wonderful, balanced self. Right. So after about two weeks of being a killer waitress, you know, <laughs> at least a $2 tip. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it's all cash, which was really fun, too, as a 19-year-old. Yeah. Um, one of the line cooks doesn't show up at work. And, you know, in our business, it's you don't call in sick. You, like, call in dead. Like, if you are if you don't show up, you just don't even bother, like, calling because you're going to get fired anyway for right. not showing up. So the manager came to me and, you know, needing to fill this spot on the line, she looked at me and said, Gail, can you cook? And I said, no, I, I can't cook. I'm from the North Shore of Chicago. You know, we make reservations. We don't. We don't cook. And she took an apron and she threw it at me and she said, you can cook now. Get in the kitchen. Wow. And it was I was really forced in, to be honest. And I wish I could find that woman to thank her now. Right. Um, so I'm hoping if I tell the story enough times, someone will be like, oh, wait, it was me. It was me. I, that was <laughs> me. Yeah, I can't wait to thank that person in, in person. So I get on the hotline and I'm completely terrified. I've never cooked professionally in my life. I've barely, you know, been working in restaurants, and 
something – I have, like, six seconds of terror of, like, holy, you know, S, what am I doing here? And second number seven, I have this funny sense of calm come over me. Like, I had found – and I, I get choked up every time I talk about it. Like, I had found my home. Mm-hmm. Like, it was like a calling. And I, I always think, like, I didn't actually pick the restaurant business. I think it picked me. I think I had the right combination of – whatever it takes to survive in this, you know, very right. challenging industry and art form. Um, so I, I just kind of sailed through that night like I was in a dream. It was like I was speaking a language I was fluent in, but I don't really remember ever learning it. And I remember I was watching the movie Ratatouille, and I, <laughs> for a second I was like, wait, wait, it was kind of like that. Like when the rat is controlling, right. you know, the little chef, the big yeah. little chef's controlling the big chef. I think it was the waitress in me was telling the cook in me, you know, oh, it's the mushroom dish with sesame seed oil. That's so-. like I knew all the cooking techniques. I knew all the ingredients for allergy reasons. And I just cooked through the description of the food wow. when it came out. So that was the moment that I had found my purpose in life. So I run home. I call my parents. I'm so excited. I finally know what I want to be. My dad, you got to understand, is a musician. He's okay. a folk, folk singer mm-hmm. and a jazz trumpet player. So for him to scrape together money for college was challenging. Right. I come home thrilled about this new direction I want to take while I'm, you know, I've just enrolled in in college, and he's really excited that he's going to have a college graduate daughter. And I tell him, guess what, Dad? I want to be a chef. (laughs) And he says, you know, Gay, he says, I guess everyone's got to eat. That's and when I look at it. That was like the supportive thing my parents yeah. said but when I'd found my calling. So I spent the next, like, eight years kind of struggling with, you know, do I please my parents? Do I please me, like right. who, who's important, what matters. Right. Um, so ultimately, food wins over everything else. Yeah. Doesn't it always, though? Well, for <laughs> me, it does. <laughs> I've, just, I've learned to accept it. it. You know, I've been doing this for 40 years now, and uh, it, it just never seems – I don't get tired of it. I don't tire. I keep finding new, you know, new pockets and new avenues and new things. Um, so for me, it doesn't end. Right. Now, well, I saw, I was watching a video of you with Julia Child with uh, Philo, <laughs> and I, I love Philo, but a lot of people don't realize yeah. that you can just buy that at the store. No, I'm I'm laughing because when I, so I got invited to be in her Baking with Julia book and also on her PBS show to do a couple episodes, and when, and they shoot her show at her house, so I got to, like, wow. go, to, go to, you know, Chef Mecca. She lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And wow. Exactly what she should live in, which is like an old, you know, sort of dingy green Victorian house. Yeah. And I remember I was in the basement, like I had arrived, and they take you downstairs to start your prep. And she was busy filming in her kitchen with another chef. Um, But she comes flying downstairs, and she's like, oh, dearie, I just can't wait to learn about (laughs) Philo, Philo, whatever you call that stuff. Oh, my gosh. And I said, well, Julia, you know, sure, certainly you've worked with Philo, but no, no, dearie, and I just can't wait till tomorrow. And it was this weird revelation wow. of, like, did Julia Child just say she can't wait to learn about Philo from me? Like, am I in opposite land? Right. It was a very, like, strange couple, of, you know, a few days at her house. So she hadn't really worked with it either. Oh, my gosh. And it is, you know, you can buy it in the freezer case. I have one international grocery store near me that has like six different brands oh wow some are some are in the freezer case and some are in the refrigerated case that you know people use it so frequently that they don't even keep it frozen and it's beautiful stuff you can make so many you know it's just like tissue paper but edible yeah no it's just that that crispiness that it when once you're done making it and it's coming out of the oven that i'm just a pastry girl so that's awesome it's like the ultimate foyetine like the ultimate puff pastry because you can build as many layers as you want and really control them and put stuff in between there's one dish i do with julia where i'm painting it with butter and sugar which is normal but i mix cocoa powder into the butter i call it cocoa butter Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) and so i make chocolate phyllo and you know she had heard i did all kinds of experimental stuff with phyllo so that's how i ended up with the phyllo chapter right the phyllo philo whatever you call right. it <laughs> right well w- 
you have eight other books. I mean, you don't just stick with uh, pastry. You have a lunch book. You have one for your true restaurant. Um, right. Yeah. And then, of course, brunch, which we're discussing today. Right, which is one of my favorite meals. You know, I, I wrote, I think the first book we did, I wrote um, American Brasserie, which was, we had a restaurant called Brasserie Tea. I used to be married to a chef. Uh, Rick Tremonto. Okay. For 12 years we were married and we worked together before that and after that. Um, you know, I thought if you marry a chef, like you'll eat really great at night. <laughs> I, you know, just to dispel that yeah. idea, if anyone's listening, you live on breakfast cereal. Right. You know, breakfast cereal in the morning, lunch, dinner, midnight snack. There's like no great truffle mashed potatoes at the end of your right. Well, well, who you... wants to do that when you're doing it all day long? So well, I, yeah. that's the funny thing. I actually do. Like I'll go cook in one of my restaurants all day and then I come home. And I still have the excitement to make dinner for my family. It's wow. not quite as fun because I'm not getting paid. You know, it's always <laughs> more fun when someone pays you. But exactly. I still love doing it. I just love thinking about food, and I love the opportunity to combine it and see what happens. And I always love my husband's praise for <laughs> the meal, so I, I keep doing it. But anyway, um, the first one was American Brasserie. Um, kind of an offshoot from Brasserie Tea, a uh, big bustling brasserie restaurant we had at the time. And then I started doing pastry books. Um, I think I have four or five of them. And then um, I had twins. Okay. So my, my last pastry book was Chocolate and Vanilla. And that was the one I wrote when I was pregnant with the twins and sentenced to bed rest. Oh. I'm like, what do I do in bed for six months? I know, right. I'll write a book. So I wrote a book on Chocolate and Vanilla. After I had the twins, you know, people wanted to come over and visit them and know them. And I tried to throw dinner parties, which we now refer to as the daunting dinner party. <laughs> I just, I couldn't do it. It was like I was too tired. They took too long. You're the chef, the waitress, you know, and the dishwasher. People exactly. don't leave. They drink too much. You know, they stay for four hours. And I thought, I, I can't do this. I, I can't do these dinner parties, but I can do brunch. Right. Like, brunch is like an hour and a half. You know, it's midday, so people have places to go. If there's a cocktail, they have, like, one. They don't get trashed and end up sleeping over. Right. So, And it brunch is really flexible in terms of what you serve. It can be cold. It can be room temp. It can be hot. You know, it can be a buffet. It doesn't have to be, like, table service with table-side saucing and stuff. So it was a doable way to gather around the table midday. And it, mm -hmm. it worked for me. It was family friendly. I didn't have to hire a sitter for my kids. You know, they could eat the food and so could other people's kids. So right. I, And then they can go play while the adults right. have fun and talk. Yeah. Right. And it just was a much more functional way to, you know, eat with people and have people over. Our our go-to thing now, like we still, the, the twins are 11. I'm still not throwing dinner parties. We do lox and bagels like every other weekend with a different couple each weekend. Oh, wow. That's and nice. it's just a great spread, and everyone kind of serves themselves. You don't have to, you know, worry that someone doesn't eat this or is allergic to that. You put it out, and if they don't like it, they don't have to put that on their bagel. So it's a way that I found as a chef and a mom of three that I could entertain. Right. Well, the book, the, the brunch cookbook, Gail Gann's Brunch, is Excellent. It has a little bit of everything for everybody. I mean, there's you have little appetizer bites, you have the soups, and you have the savory, and then, of course, the desserts, which I love. But also in the very back, you have menus, which I find just incredible. That's, you know, if you're going to have something, you don't really want to plan it out, you can just turn to the back and look at the menu. Grab a yeah. menu and do that. And the idea was, you know, you could just put out a bunch of pastry that you've bought from a, you know, a quality bakery, throw a cinnamon stick in your coffee filter along with the coffee you're making, and that could be brunch. Like right. It doesn't have to be hard. It's more about having people over and sharing time at the table together with them because I think that just solves every problem in the world. Like all problems get worked out over food at the table. Yeah. But then, you know, if you want to layer in something room temperature, like, you know, sometimes I'll just make a stack of crepes the day before, and mm. then I'll warm them up and I'll put them out with, you know, jar of Nutella, jar of peanut butter, fresh cut bananas and strawberries, thing of yogurt, thing of, you know, can of spritz of whipped cream, 
powdered sugar and let people roll their own. Sometimes I'll do a strata. That's a, another do ahead. You know, a lot of do yeah. ahead stuff with that's, brunch. You know, I never even thought about cooking crepes the night before and heating them. How do you heat them up then in the microwave? So I just when I'm making the crepes, I just stack them up on a plate, cover it with plastic wrap, throw it in the fridge. You can even freeze them. Oh. Um, so. You know, make sure they're not frozen when you're nuking them. But I just warm them for like a minute in the microwave, the whole stack. Yeah, that's a great idea. And they're they're terrific. And kids love them. They get it. Um, you know, so I find that there's a lot of flexibility with brunch. You know, we've all eaten cold quiche and know it's good. Yeah. It doesn't have to be piping hot, whereas these dinner parties, like everything has to, you know, coordinate and be served together. So I give you sort of the 101s of brunch. That chapter that has the five different, you know, has a frittata, an omelet, a strata, quiche, crepe. So give you that and give you variations on it. By the, you know, I give I think five variations in each. By the time you get to like the third variation, you've got it. Right. Like you own it, and you've got your own ideas of what to combine that work for your flavor palette. Um, and then we go on to you know pancakes and waffles and bacon waffles and all kinds of extra stuff. And then it's like you know. Couldn't apricot chicken salad, you know, on little sourdough rolls be brunch? It could. Yeah. Or cold salmon or a barley salad with, you know, little, there's those great tomatoes out now where, like, they're all sort of cherry tomato mm-hmm. size, but it's a variety of, you know, heirloom types. Um, so I include salads in there. Um and then there's, you know, baked goods, my, that pear juice little coffee cake. If you don't make anything else from my book, make that. Okay. That's, it's the best. It's better the second day. So it's one of those recipes, you know, do ahead totally. Um, you can make it with apples as well as pears. And it's it's one of my Grandma Elsie's recipes. So mm. I, I take no credit. Right. <laughs> that I thought to look through her file card, you know, box and saw this recipe. It's, it's the cutest recipe. It's got like one egg. It's such Aww. a depression recipe. Yeah, right. What has one egg in it anymore, <laughs> right? But it comes out so delicious. You don't even peel the pears. The peel just kind of like no. melts into the coffee cake. So do that well, one. It's an easy one. It's, a, it's an easy one to do. That's the thing I like about a lot of these recipes is that they're simple. You think you have to be so extravagant when you're having a, a brunch party or something like that. But these recipes are yeah. easy and nice and concise, not a lot of ingredients. You know, when I'm doing cooking demonstrations or teaching, sometimes I hesitate to wear a chef coat <laughs> because it kind of makes it look like you need to be a chef to do this stuff, and you don't. A lot of my recipes are things I develop to do with my kids. Right. So I'll do it. Like, I've done demos with my twins when they were four years old, and I have them make that pear sousa coffee cake in front of the audience. I just wow. stand back. And they do it. And my point is like, uh, hello, a four-year-old's doing this. You know, what's your excuse for not baking? Exactly. Uh, I'm putting it in the oven for them. But they're stirring everything together. They're measuring everything. So, you know, it's really easy stuff. You brought up the frittata and the strata mm-hmm. and the quiche and the galette. What are the differences? I'll, have to, I'll be honest. I, what, I don't know the difference between the four of those. Are they just different names? Are there different things no, you have to have? Them? They're literally like different formats. So an omelet, you know, is kind of like scrambled eggs, but you let it, right. you know, all set in one big disc at the end, and then you're filling it with whatever and folding it over yeah. versus a frittata, which sometimes has some starch in it, like co- cooked pasta um, or rice, but usually it has, you know, chopped up vegetables and add additions, but that you don't fold. It's served in a large disc cut into wedges. Okay. So it's even easier probably than an omelet. A quiche has a crust to it, so it's a custard. Okay. You're pouring into that crust and baking off, again, serving in wedges. So it's like a savory pie. So if you find a recipe for a crustless quiche, you're making a frittata? Uh, well, probably not because a quiche is baked in the oven, whereas frittata okay. is done on the stove. Okay. So you can okay. ignore a quiche more than you can ignore a frittata. <laughs> Okay, okay. So, you know, there's the walk-away factor you have to consider. Now, right. a strata is like a savory bread pudding. So the base mm. is cubed up bread with sort of that quiche custard poured over it and stuff in it, like broccoli and shredded chicken and jalapenos and cheese, okay. and that's baked. Um, so that would be a strata. And then crepes is sort of the other, like, you know, mother sauce of breakfasts. So I give a, 
just my mother's standard. My mom was Jewish, so they were blintzes when I was growing up. But it's mm. it's the same thing. Every country has like a wrapper. Right. You know, cannellone in Italy is basically a crepe, which is basically a polichinta in Hungary and a blintz, you know, in the rest of the Jewish world. So it's a wrapper that you can put stuff in. Or if you want to get fancy, you know, make crepe Suzettes on the stove. Right. Um, those are not stuffed, but they're kind of uh, dressed in uh, orange sauce that's got some Grand Marnier mm. in it. So all the same stuff, though. Mm-hmm. Well, I do. Yeah. Oh, that 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 breaks it down. Yeah. What I do also love about your book is are the little tips like uh, how to get eggshells out. Yes, (laughs) because I teach so much. Yeah, I love teaching. Um, I'm often, you know, I'm in the situation where I got a piece of eggshell in there. And I've learned over time that, like, you don't chase it with your finger. There's something about – there's some kind of resistant force that happens. And it'll just run away from you, embarrassingly. (laughs) You know, you can't, like, catch this thing. But if you use the eggshell that already has some of that albumin in it and go scoop out the little bit of shell with the – you yeah, know, if you're half eggshell, it's like attracted to it. It's the opposite. Right. So, yeah, just stuff, you know, like that, that's practical chef advice um, that's going to make your life a little bit easier. My my goal is to get you to cook. And when you cook, I want you to have success so that you have all this joy like I get in the kitchen so you do it again. I sort of think I can fix the whole world by <laughs> getting everyone to cook for each other. I somehow think that that – has some magic. Like, I feel like if I could just get, you know, politicians together cooking in a, <laughs> in a workshop, like I could get them to all get along. Yeah. Well, um, that'd be nice. <laughs> there's something magic about food. So I, you know, I'll do whatever it takes to get people in the kitchen. And if that means getting a store-bought crust for your quiche to get a quiche in your oven, I am totally okay with that. Right. I'm not a food snob. You know, if you... If what's holding you up, like I, I ask people to look at, like, why don't you make pie? Like, what's the hold up? Is it that you can't stand to peel the fruit? Then buy it peeled. Is it you can't, you know, you're afraid of making crust? I can teach you how to make a great crust easily. But if that's the hold up and you don't want to wait for, you know, pie camp with me, <laughs> go buy one. It's totally fine. I'd rather you have things baking and cooking in your home for your family and get that connection going. Right. Then, you know, then not and wait for you to get it perfectly right and exactly right with the right kind of butter and, you know, the right equipment and all that stuff. Right. Which brings me, where do you find quail eggs? One of the recipes inside your your book is uh, quail eggs. Actually, that international grocery store I mentioned yeah. with the uh, the seven kinds of phyllo, they have yeah. quail eggs too. Wow. They're in the, it's called Fresh Farms. Okay. And it's this interesting international grocery store, but there's a couple of them in the Chicago area that sort of cater to – You know, all different ethnic backgrounds because Chicago is this real melting pot. You know, we've got Indian and Hungarian and German and Polish, and everybody needs their different stuffed noodle. You know, it's either a tortellini or it's a kolachki or it's a kreplacher, and they've got them all at the store. Then they have, like, dates on the vine. They have lychees in the shell. I never. Have you ever seen um, garbanzo beans in the shell? I have not. It's I was I didn't even know what I was looking at and it looks sort of like a peanut shell but green. Oh. And you pop them out and then you boil them like blanch them and they look just like the ones in the can. Wow, but, yeah. Like I didn't know. <laughs> so, right, right. So that's where I they have quail eggs, they have um preserved duck eggs on the shelf there. Wow. And there's a big Asian community around here so Okay. So I get them at the grocery store. Wow. Yeah, well we're getting, you know, we're getting a little bit better here in Lancaster County. We're starting to get a I believe there's a new store coming in soon. That's an international food mm. store, so maybe we'll be able to find that. Yeah, so. they're really fun and it helps you sort of branch out and, you know, eat other kinds of chocolate and different yeah. snack foods and, you know, interesting biscuits and stuff. We like it a lot. Right. Now, I'll bring up, since we're talking about eggs, I have to ask, hard-boiled eggs, I know you have the tip in there how to do it, but I grew up where you'd break open the hard-boiled egg and the yolk was green on the outside. (laughs) (laughs) And to me, that just seemed normal. But now knowing that's not normal, what, how do you keep that from happening? We're we're all being retaught that that means overcooked. (laughs) Khaki means overcooked egg. Um, So it's, it's really the amount of time that it's being cooked or boiled. 
Um, and I think in my lunch book, I give like another other different new version in brunch. I'm doing sort of Julia Child's version where you put the eggs in cold water, bring them to a boil. As soon as they come to a boil, you turn it off and you let them sit. Okay, yeah. And that's like enough time, which think how crazy different that is from what we were taught. We were like, oh, oh yeah, now boil for seven minutes. Exactly. <laughs> right. Put it on, let it boil, right. walk away, go get ready for school, come back later. <laughs> right, right. So um, I think in the, because I do, you know, I thought um, in my lunch book, which came after brunch, I did some simple sandwiches also. I did like PB&J, which is the longest recipe in the book. It's hilarious. Like you'd think the simplest sandwich would be nothing but as I started writing it got really elaborate and different combinations and my husband like peanut butters both sides of the bread so the jelly oh yes he like waterproofs both pieces so the jelly doesn't absorb he thinks that's so there are opinions (laughs) about how to construct a pb and j but anyway there's an egg salad recipe as well so I have a, a new one where I let you um I let you boil them for five minutes, and that makes people a little more comfortable. Right. But if you just do five minutes versus, like, the seven-minute egg that we're, yeah. we're raised with, it'll come out, you know, perfectly yellow without the khaki. Okay, I'll have to try that. Yeah, I really did. I grew up with you walk away and you come back when some of the eggs are cracked. <laughs> oh, so it's the expansion <laughs> you're looking for. Yes, I guess. That's what my mother wow. did. Of course, you know, my mother wasn't much of a cook, so... <laughs> Right. Now, was your mother a cook? Did you grow up with, uh, you know, <laughs> someone always in the kitchen? My mother was a resentful cook. She was a <laughs> feminist. So okay. she, she had a great talent for it, and her father was a chemist. So she saw the chemistry and physics and understood it um, yeah. that's involved in the kitchen. But she also resented that, you know, women were stuck in the kitchen. Right. And so she had a really, you know, hate love-hate relationship with cooking. Um, which was communicated to me. I I baked with her a lot. She had bad circulation, so cold hands, which mm-hmm. makes for a great pie maker. You know, you can mm. handle pie dough really well, and I have the same thing. So I made a lot of pies with her, and I inherited her pie hands. Oh. Um, but there was a lot of precision because she was a chemist's daughter, and I have dyslexia, mm. which, you know, went kind of undiagnosed in the 60s. Right. So I would reverse measurements. I would reverse ingredients when I was cooking with her. And my mom was so nice about it. She wouldn't say like, oh, God, you ruined, you know, right. the cookies. She'd be like, oh, look, Gail invented something new. <laughs> so I was <laughs> That's sweet. considered creative and inventive, yeah. you know, because of my disability that we didn't even realize I have. Um, so, you know, she sort of spent her life trying to get out of the kitchen. And when I made that call at 19 and said I wanted to be a chef, you know, if if the Godfather movies had been out at that time, she would have had that Michael Corleone <laughs> moment where he's like, yeah. you know, I spent my life trying to get out and they're pulling me right back in. Right, that's, right. I think that's how my mother felt when I said I wanted to be wow. a chef. But, you know, what she didn't know or understand is – how, you know, I was going to get paid for it. She was, she was stuck at home cooking for, you know, my dad and clients and teachers and whatever. For me, it was not only, you know, an income, but it was a, it was an art form. Right. So I was getting an artistic outlet. Yeah. yeah, I was getting a lot of emotional satisfaction and, and self-expression. Right. Well, if your father is a musician and you went into the art field, really, baking and cooking really is, it's an art. That's what I told them. Yeah. Where we, I wish you had been on that call. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and I was in art school at the time and I was said, you know, this is more of a fine art than fine art because right. not only does it involve, you know, sight and, you know, some art involves audio like sound, but it involved all five senses. It involved touch and taste and, you know, everything, smell. So it seemed like a much more complex art form to me than even my, you know, three-dimensional classes. I was taking painting. I was taking silver and goldsmithing. Um, right. I was in, you know, blacksmithing class doing iron work. And wow. my food was more complex than those art forms. But, you know, it's hard to tell your parents that when all they can picture is like a sweaty blue collar guy smoking a cigarette, yeah. you know, and the ashes are falling into the fried eggs that he's making. Right. You know, our our right. industry hadn't been legitimized by Wolfgang Puck yet. No, right. So I was asking my parents to imagine something that didn't exist except in my You know, it's perfectly clear to me, you know, to my 19-year-old mind, but not to them. 
This is Love You a Brunch, the show for those who'd rather be brunching. Hi, I'm Jody Stapler. Today I'm speaking to Gail Gann, restaurateur, nationally acclaimed pastry chef, cookbook author, TV personality, teacher, entrepreneur, and mother. Not only do we speak to her about one of her cookbooks, Gail Gann's Brunch, but we also spoke to her about her life, her family, and how she got started in the food industry. So stay with us on Love You a Brunch. I walk the floor from- now, when you are uh, looking at your brunch cookbook, do you have a, sp- a specific recipe that's your favorite or one that you just recommend to everybody? You know, I, I feel like that's asking, like, which is my favorite my three kids? Which, <laughs> exactly. You know, you're not supposed to have a favorite. I actually yeah. do, but I will never <laughs> Um, well, I mentioned the pear streusel coffee cake. There's also there's these pear um, tartlets, and the picture's super cute. That's the twins like in the photo yeah. stealing them off right. the table during the photo shoot. But it's just puff pastry and slices of pear with like a little dollop of um, sour cream and a little knob of uh, almond paste and mm. a little cinnamon sugar, and you kind of smush it all together, and then it sort of blossoms like a flower in the oven, and they're those are delicious. Um, there's also the asparagus. Um, I think it has, is it the one that has walnuts and goat's cheese over the top? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one I love. But what I love to do is make like a fried egg and, and drape it over the asparagus. Okay. Um, I think that's delicious. The apricot chicken salad that I mentioned is one of my faves. Uh, what else? For the stratas, there's the chicken broccoli jalapeno, which mm-hmm. I mentioned. Um, but that one I think is a, a good place to start. I get a lot of, um, you know, I get tagged on Facebook all the time because people are making <laughs> my stratas. I have all these stratas show oh, on my that's Facebook nice. page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Especially that's great holidays. feedback. Yeah. I actually really like, um, I made these a couple weeks ago for my kids, the baked eggs in the ham cups. You know, I was going to mention that. So the cover girl, which yeah. is a great cover. And they look difficult and they're not at all no they're not and they're great because you know what i i i'm a hand eater i prefer to eat with my hands and so you can pick those up and eat them almost like a cupcake you totally can i was going to mention that because i made them on um is it the today show that al roker is one of them okay yeah so al roker made he's quite a cook i don't know if you know that but al made them with me and the whole crew came up after and just like grabbed them with their hands and yeah. were eating them room temp you know, in their hands, they call them ham cupcakes. Um, <laughs> yeah, and you that's can, what they are. <laughs> you can make them small, too. You could do them in mini muffin tins, right. but, you know, cut out the ham with a round cutter small and then find those quail eggs and do it with yeah. quail eggs. You can do it with scrambled eggs, too. So say your kids don't love, you know, the white separate from the yolk. So just scramble up a bunch of eggs really loosely and then spoon them into the ham that's, you know, already in your muffin tins. And so the bake time is going to be like three minutes just to set that at the end. Yeah. You could fold some cheese into it maybe and, you know, put, fill them with scrambled eggs. So you could do that with minis too. Now that's a great idea. One of the other ones I want to try this summer is watermelon gazpacho. Oh, I just made that um, with a bunch of school kids to, you know, do some really easy, fast cooking. So it's it's basically, you know, blender you're just blending up cubes of watermelon. And watermelon is the place I start with kids in terms of giving them knife skills mm. and let them cut it up with a table knife so they, they can't hurt themselves, but they can actually, you know, cut it into something it. Yeah. that's a dish. Yeah. You know, they can cut this watermelon up and eat it. So they've sort of prepared their own thing. But it's cut up watermelon. You can sweeten with sugar if needed, but sometimes I use um, apple juice concentrate mm. as another way to sweeten if it needs it. And then the garnishes are, you know, up for grabs, but just think color. So you've got that pink watermelon base, mm-hmm. you know, green apple, cucumber, but red bell pepper, you know, fresh mozzarella balls or a little swirl of, you know, maybe Greek yogurt. It's a very light, fresh. Yeah, it seems um, perfect for summertime healthy. when it's hot outside and you just need something cold. Yes, I'm going to be doing I'm going to be demoing that at the Palm Desert Food and Wine Festival this year. Wow. You know, whenever I go out there, it's, you know, I go in March or April when the festival is cuz Chicago's freezing. Right. <laughs> Anything in California, the answer is yes. I don't exactly. even care what the event is. 
But, you know, when I get out there, it's hot. And so I'm doing this, you know, chilled, refreshing, cold watermelon gazpacho. So it's a riff on the traditional tomato gazpacho, right. but using fruit instead of tomatoes. Right. No, that's definitely one I'm going to be doing this summer. Nice. Yeah. And you have a lot of drinks in your uh, cookbook as well, which you have some hot co- hot cocoa with brown su- light brown sugar. And then you also have some white hot chocolate. Yeah, there's a white chocolate, white hot chocolate. Yep. Yeah, so that would be more for, you know, probably winter months. Right, right. Um, which we have a lot of yeah. <laughs> in Chicago. But, yeah, I think if you've got a beverage to kind of hold on to as a way to start the meal, as a thing to offer when people arrive, especially I find this syndrome where, like, one person arrives early mm. And my hair's not dry yet, <laughs> and I still need, like, 10 more minutes. And so what I do is I have everything set up for the beverage, whether it's a, you know, mango spritzer using Prosecco and a wedge of lime, or it's, a you know, a hot chocolate. I bring them into the kitchen. You know, I show them where the coats go, bring them in the kitchen. I offer them one drink, so I'm not having to rattle off, like, a whole, you know, oh, do you right. want a glass of this? Or blah, blah, blah. I say, today we're having... You know, mango yeah. spritzers with lime, would you like one? And they say yes, of course. And I say, you know, alcoholic or non, because you can do it with soda water or, you know, serum right. mist or something. And they say, you know, I'll take it with the, the bubbly, whatever you use. I show them how to make it. And then I say, listen, can you answer the door if the doorbell <laughs> rings? I'm going to go upstairs and dry my hair. So I suddenly have a sous chef or a bartender. There you go. Um, in punishment for showing yeah. up early. <laughs> But it makes it so easy to kind of get things going, get something in people's hands, but they don't have to make a big decision. Right. You know, I, I hate that when I go into a home and they're like, oh, would you like red wine or white wine or a beer? Or, you know, they rattle off this. Uh, and you, I do this math of like, well, I wonder what they have open and I don't want them to open it just for me. Exactly. So I don't love all those options because I don't have enough information to know what right. to pick. So I like to have just one thing. Yeah, it's a great idea. And I like uh, teaching them how to do it so they get to do it. <laughs> You're right. You can, and, you know, have the glasses set up and the lime wedge is cut and already on the rims of the glass. The other thing I do is I go in my cupboard and I see which glasses are dustiest. <laughs> and I use those. I, I, of course, wash them first. Yes. But that shows me, like, what glassware I haven't used, used lately. For a while. Yeah. Yeah. I have, like, I have these really, I think they're really cool um, 1950s glasses that have oh, like cool. gold diamonds on yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. But I use them all the time because I think they're so cool. And so everyone's seen them. No one's impressed. You right. know, they get it. So this is how I force myself to use all my glassware. I look and see what's dirty, which means I haven't used it in a while. You know, it's got right. has like dust or film on it. I wash and it doesn't matter. You know, it might be the red wine glasses. Still use yeah. those. You wouldn't believe how it sort of pushes you to a more interesting place to put a drink in something you might not normally grab for that style of drink. Right. So it makes it fun. Yeah. Now, I I did notice in your tips that you say that you always use or you usually use unsalted butter. This is true. Um, Some of that is just when I was growing up, unsalted butter was more expensive than salted it was like a treat yeah and on my birthday every year my mom would get a couple things she would get half and half that I got to pour in my cereal instead of milk and she would buy a stick of unsalted butter and this really killer poached ham that we used to get at the bakery along with a loaf of Danish rye bread which Mm. was this really soft rye bread and the loaves were baked right next to each other so they had that like rip right rip apart side yeah and this is funny because my mother was jewish and like the big treat was this ham sandwich yeah i was thinking with unsalted (laughs) butter like that's so wrong and so yeah (laughs) but it was like once a year we would do this on my birthday so you know when i got my show on food network um it was the first ever all dessert and all pastry show it was a really big deal um and honestly it paid really well and, you know, some people, when they get their Food Network show, like buy a new house or they buy an Escalade or you right, know, they right. do their kitchen. My thing was I started buying unsalted butter, like, yeah. all the time. Like, that well, was my big yeah. reward. That was my That's your luxury. That I had arrived. <laughs> I had unsalted butter every day of yeah, the year, funny. not just my birthday. So I do use it. The other thing is um, – you know, butter is 82% fat. Mm-hmm. That's a government-regulated thing. 
So there's 18% of something else in there, and it can right. be a combination of milk, milk solids, water, salt, whatever. And there's no way to know, like, how much is really in there. So not that it's 18% salt, but it it legally could be. Right. So, you know, you're paying a lot of money for butter, and to pay for salt by the pound at the same price you pay for butter doesn't make sense to me. That's so true. The other thing is salt's a natural preservative, mm-hmm. and I feel like salted butter can live on the shelf in the grocery store longer than unsalted. Yeah. So I kind of feel like unsalted butter is maybe a little fresher. Right. So all those things put together. That's true. Yeah, I didn't think about that either. And, and, you know, I know grocery stores are very meticulous about turning over their products and sell-by dates and stuff. But in theory, you know. Right, right. Now, I, I'm going to bring up margarine. What do you think about margarine? <laughs> I just <laughs> fell off my chair. Exactly, right? We don't, we're not even allowed to. That's like a four-letter word in my house. I believe it. But you know what? The everyday normal people, that's what they're buying instead they of are butter. Not. Yeah, they oh, are yes, not. they are. It isn't so. I, I wish they Well, I mean, and I know, you know, there was a generation of recipes where that was, you know, I saw an old, um, it was a Kraft macaroni and cheese you know, blue box. I'm already cringing. <laughs> I, it was in like an antique store. It was at one of those antique malls. Okay. And this guy had all this stuff from the 60s, and one of them was a Kraft macaroni and cheese, you know, box of Kraft macaroni and cheese, new in box, never been opened. Oh, my gosh. And so I'm reading the instructions to see, like, how the portions changed, you know, how has the yeah. portion size changed, have, have the ingredients changed. And because Kraft Foods was also owned Parquet, it recommends parquet margarine okay. as the fat versus butter. So I'd love right. to see, like, what year did that switch back? Yeah. Um, it, isn't that amazing that that box lasted this long? <laughs> I know. I, I There's something about that that I completely love, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. I love the sort of historic, um, you know, changes that you see culinarily in America. Right. We've had this huge surge over the last decade or you know, decade and a half, which I attribute a lot of it to Food Network. Oh, completely. Um, that, you know, has changed what our grocery stores look like, how we write menus, um, you know, how we perceive dining. The whole thing, we've just grown up so much, and it's changed, you know, what kind of chocolate we buy. Oh, yeah. You know, we used to only buy milk chocolate. It's all we could handle. And now, you know, we're able to handle more intense flavors. Cocoa powder has stopped being Dutch. You know, the Mm -hmm. Dutch process mellows it and makes it, like, not so acidic and not so sharp. Yeah. And now, like, undutched cocoa powder is available readily. Right. Um, So I feel like uh, I'm watching this little kid grow up, culinarily speaking, and our palate's getting more sophisticated. So I think margarine will fall out of I hope so. favor. You know, it will it will naturally yeah. be, become an endangered species and then be gone. You know, it is an endangered species that scares me, though, in the grocery store, is cake flour. It, you know what? You don't see that very often. You don't see it much, and I'm worried, like, one of the days I go to buy some, it's just not going to be there because not enough people are baking with it. But it is it is one of the great, you know, a lot of the early sort of pound cakes and marble cakes and, you know, recipes from our grandparents used right. cake flour. Now, what is the difference between a cake flour and all-purpose flour and maybe like a bread flour? Um, they have different protein contents, which is what makes them sort of tougher or more tender. Okay. And it's a, you know, a percentage range, like cake flour falls within I, – I, can't remember the range, but it's like three to seven percent protein, and then all purpose is like seven to ten or eleven, and then bread flour is you know ten to thirteen percent protein, and then high gluten flour is above that even. Okay. So it's just about how much protein is naturally occurring in that particular wheat. Right. Um, and if you go to other countries, the wheat is different. Like I lived in England for three years, and because they don't have those cold winters. The variety of wheat that grows there is not as, like, macho and doesn't have yeah. high of protein content. We have, like, winter wheat here in right. America that, you know, grows in really, like, survives cold winters. Theirs doesn't have to survive as rough of winters, and so it doesn't have as high of protein. So their flowers tend to be softer than ours, so their mm. bread tends to be wimpier. Like, you can't get a good crusty bread 
made with British wheat. Right. Um, you have to go to, you go to France and, you know, get, which is right. the best thing about England anyway is France. Everything's so close. <laughs> France is a 45-minute flight away. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so that's sort of what the difference is. And okay. I think, you know, we have come accustomed to just keeping one kind of flour in yeah. our house because we don't, people don't bake as much as they used to. No, it's true. So go out and buy a box of cake flour, just even if you don't need it. Just yeah, just to, just to keep it coming just to keep in it and being a supply. You're going to need it. Yeah, yeah. I'll be honest. I, even when it says cake flour, I've always just used all purpose. I know. Like, it's what we have here, whatever. I know. That, I know. That's what people do. And I think, too, it fell out of favor because it needs sifting because it yeah. kind of mats together differently. Yeah. Um, I actually, I teach once a year at King Arthur Flour up in Vermont. Mm. And the reason I started teaching there was I wanted to learn, like, what what is the difference between all these different flowers? Let me, you know, letting me go to the Grand Poobah of right. flowers and find out. So I return every year to to further, you know, oh, develop my flower knowledge. But they, yeah. they do a I'm, – I'm confident that they will continue to do cake flour even if, you know, the grocery stores stop doing it. Right, right. You have to get it at your specialty store. Yeah. So you do teach a lot of – cooking classes. I do. I teach a lot. Um, and I do a lot of cooking demonstrations. Um, so some are, you know, smaller hands-on classes, 20 to 40 people. But I also do a lot of demos for like 100 and 200 people at, you know, libraries and senior centers and women's clubs and garden clubs. And I do a lot of keynote speaking. I basically do stand-up a lot. I get hired <laughs> to like speak during your luncheon about, you know, quirky stuff in the restaurant business. Yeah, right. And there's a lot of it. <laughs> I've seen a lot of a a lot of backstory yeah. of stories. Um, so I do teach a lot. I teach um, sometimes at Elowa Farm, which is an organic historic farm near me outside of Chicago in Lake Forest, Illinois. But then I teach at big places like Italy in Chicago and Blackberry Farm and King Arthur Flower and um, Zingerman's in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I've taught there a couple times. Um, so I basically think of places I want to go and then find a cooking school in that area and, and then walk in. Like my son goes to college um, in Ohio at the okay. College, of, College of Worcester in Worcester, Ohio. It's a small liberal arts school with 2,000 smart kids. So I was visiting him once, and I saw a little cookware store, and I walked in. I'm like, hi, I'm Gail Gann. I'm really famous. Can I <laughs> Can I do a class at your store? And they're, you know, they're like quickly Googling me right, and right. Uh, being very nice about my, you know, forward cold call. <laughs> but, um, you know, as soon as they figured out who I was and what I do, they're like, absolutely. And my classes sell out. I've got two in March um, that I'm doing. I've got one or two in May that I'm going back for. So it allows me to visit my son or pick him up for spring right. break, but stay out of his hair. Like it gives me something to do. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I was visiting a girlfriend in Massachusetts for her daughter's shower, My one of my best friends, Marth, from art school, and her daughter Lila was having her bridal shower and asked if I would come and do the cake. And uh, well, that must be nice. So I, it was, well, I had a lot. I love it. like, ooh, I know Gail Gann. Let her make my cake. <laughs> so I found the local cookware store, and I'm like, listen, I'm going to be in town. You know, you want to do a book signing in a class. And yeah. So it's kind of what I do when I come to town. Right, right. You're a busy, busy woman, I swear. My gosh, you're teaching classes, you're doing like all these talks and book signings. And of, of course, you have, how many restaurants do you have right now? Well, I have partnership in three, but I don't have day to day responsibilities in any of them. Okay. I have assistants that, you know, do stuff. Um, I design the desserts, but I train them into my assistant and then they like put in the 50 hour Good. work week. I'm not doing that. Yeah. So I kind of, you know, cobble together a living from the seven or eight, you know, different things that I do. I do food innovation for a company here in Chicago. So I'm inventing new foods oh, wow. and desserts for large restaurant chains and, yeah. you know, large food companies. Um, so I kind of have this, you know, really broad range of ways that I'm involved in food. Um, and I actually just recently um, I was at – one of my other best – I'm like a kindergartner where I have, like, five <laughs> best friends. So I was at one of my other best friends' house for her 60th birthday and making her cake in Dallas, Texas. Nice. And there was an art dealer there, and my friend has a couple pieces of mine that I did, some drawings and paintings that I do. 
And the dealer saw him, and he's like, are these yours? And I said, yeah. He goes, you got any more of them? I'm like, do I? Yeah. Why, why do you think I got into cooking? Because you right. don't have to keep your work. You know, it's gone in three days. Exactly. With painting, like, you have to store everything that doesn't sell. Yeah. So he's like, I think I could sell your work. And he does art placement in like corporate settings oh cool people's homes and stuff like that it's not a gallery and I'm not going to the art museum or anything but um I started drawing again and pulling out the hundreds of drawings I have oh very cool um, so where can people find them so that, well they're going to be on his website um it, the gallery is called Kincaid okay gallery so I think it's just Kincaid.com yeah um, his name is Daniel Kincaid and uh I'm not there yet we're just tweaking all the photos, right. getting my artist statement written and bio and all that kind of stuff. But give us like maybe, and he's in Cuba right now, but give us like three months and my stuff will be up on there. Wow. You're just into everything. The rule of fear, the art. <laughs> the and then you were also in a family band, weren't you? Yes. So my, well, my dad was a musician. So as a kid, like starting at age six, I was on stage with my dad and my brother, who's a musician as well, playing in the Gann Family Singers. So we would travel around the country like we played at Expo 67 in Montreal in, in 1967. We played at Disneyland. We'd go to the North Carolina Fiddlers Convention. Oh, that was awesome. how, which is why I think I like work when I'm on vacation at the right. bookstore stores. The only vacations we took were musical ones to go yeah. perform at the Arkansas Folk Festival. So I always joke we were like the Von Trapp family singers, but without the Nazis. <laughs> oh, so my gosh. Didn't yeah. Have, didn't have that pesky part. But we just, we sang everywhere. We were singing family. I did, you know, really sad state fairs. I did, you know, Christmas assemblies at schools. I was yeah. just on stage constantly, which is where I got the skills to do something like Sweet Dreams, my show on Free right. Network. You know, that's right. why I'm comfortable on camera because right. I was in front of an audience my whole life. And in when we were in Montreal playing at the World's Fair, I had to do all my introductions in French. Oh, wow. And, I, you know, I didn't speak French in fifth yeah. grade, but I phonetically had to learn all these you know, yeah. like patterns in French. So, um, yeah, it's like this really interesting, weird, you know, I just choke. I, I was raised by wolves, like yeah. weird upbringing. My, my father just passed away a year ago. Oh, no, uh, I'm memorial sorry. Memorial service, my brother was remarking, you know, when you'd come back from summer break, at, you know, in the fall to school and people would say, you know, what they did on their summer vacation, you know, kids like built a, you know, built a, mini bike or you know right, right. went to day camp and ours was like oh yeah we drove cross country to play at you know the world's fair in spokane washington or right like we were always working and performing and it was just it was a different life than yeah. what my friends had but it kept me out of the sun so i, <laughs> I didn't suntan as a, yeah or, or lay at the beach as a young lady so yeah. i have less wrinkly skin than my there you go <laughs> Yes, and as a redhead with very pale skin, I stay out as well. Uh, you know, and I and then when I once I started working in kitchens, I never saw the light of day. So I right, and I always joke, you know, it's hot in kitchens and humid, and so I've been moisturized. moisturized. Yeah. yeah, and then I moisturize within with butter. So. Wow, well, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Right. That's great. Where can people find your root beer? Well, it's sold nationally. Um, my my distributor is Cisco, which is a large you know, okay, yeah, huge distributor that goes all over the country. Right. So when I was in up in Vermont teaching at King Arthur, like they were able to order cases of it from their you know Cisco rep. Um, yeah. It's cinnamon vanilla ginger flavored root beer. Oh, yum. Um, I live near Nielsen Massey Vanilla, which is probably the world's best cold press processed vanilla. Okay. They have a plant here in Waukegan, Illinois, near me, and then one in the Netherlands for Europe. So I use their vanilla. So it's sort of local for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I infuse ginger root and cinnamon stick. So you'll taste these sort of spices in the root beer as well as that kind of Yum. warm, round flavor that vanilla provides. Um, but you can get it all over. In the Chicago area, I know it's at Sunset Foods. Um, it's at Fresh Farms. It's in sort of like boutique grocery stores and restaurants. It's, you know, on menus of tea houses and all kinds of different places. Yeah. I also um, did some recipe development for a new company, a new jerky company called Think Jerky. 
and um, I have a, a turkey jerky flavor that's honey sriracha, and then oh. I get a sesame orange yeah. um, beef jerky, and it's their chef-driven recipe, so all the flavors. Laurent Gras did one, and Matt Truce, who's another chef here in Chicago, oh, cool. did one. So you'll, you might see that pop up, too. You can go online and find Think Jerky. Um, and it's sort of, um, it's like not big honking hunks of it. It's little pieces that are easier to snack on. Yeah. And the packaging isn't like flaming bowls that are red. Right. <laughs> like for men, it's like white packaging with really stark lettering and beautiful photos and stuff. Right. So oh, that's, that's awesome. Some of the million things that I do. I was going to mention in my drawings, the funny thing is, um, looking back now, there's food in almost every single oh. one. Like, I didn't even know back then that I was going to be cooking professionally, but there's like little lobsters drawn and little yeah. pans of fried eggs and there's <laughs> foreshadowing <laughs> like floating around. Yes, yeah. It's very funny. Your husband must be exhausted being your husband. <laughs> I think he would totally agree if he was here in the room. He's a stay at home dad. Um, so that's, oh, that's part of awesome. how we're able to pull this off. Yeah. Um, my husband wishes he could be the stay at home dad. <laughs> he, well, it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. It's not as great as it sounds. You know, right. It's tough. Um, but I think just my husband's exhausted watching me. He says, you're like an ant. Like you yeah. just never stop. Yeah. And it's fascinating to him to, to sort of see how I, you know, figuratively and literally stir the pot just all day long to kind right. of move stuff forward. Right. Yeah. My, my, I have to say, we were just on vacation in Cape Cod this past weekend, and I'm a workaholic as well. Like, I have, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm constantly having to be doing stuff like that. It drives my husband crazy. So I can't even imagine with all your different industries that you're involved in. How, you know, you just, you, know, you touch each one a little bit each day or, you know, I look at the to-do list and see, okay, which is the easiest thing on there? So right. Get the sensation of crossing something off to build momentum so that I can do the next thing. And I just, I'm just doing that every day. But, you know, I love the work or I would stop. Right. I really, I really do. Right. Well, yeah, if you sat, if you were still for too long, I'm sure you'd be miserable. And I'm still thinking about, like, what am I going to make for dinner? Maybe like <laughs> salmon with black rice. Like, Ooh. what overlays everything? Yeah. It's, like, hilarious. You know, it's right. still, like... Huh, what am I going to make for dinner? Those lamb stuffed pitas I did the other day were really good, but oh. remember those meatballs? Maybe I should do you know? Your kids are so lucky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I am. You have no idea. I'm so yeah. lucky. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Well, um, let's see. They can go to your website at gailgan.com. Is that right? That's right. Um, find your also, classes. Yeah. There's a calendar there that shows where I am and what I'm doing and how to find me. Um, also, I have a square store, so you can go to that if you want to buy books and have oh, them cool. autographed and personalized. You can get there through my website. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on. And you I'm know. so glad we finally were able to find a time that it worked for us. Yes. Well, thanks so much for having <laughs> Thank me. Thank you. It was Love such a pleasure. To you. you too. Take care. I'd like to thank Gail Gann for joining us today. Make sure you check out her website, gailgand.com, where you can find out information about all of her cookbooks, including Gail Gann's Brunch, her root beer, her classes, her beef jerky, and her art. So thank you so much, Gail Gand, and please join us next time on Love You a Brunch. Please visit us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Love You a Brunch. Also, if you'd like to ask a question or want to share a story, go ahead and Skype us at Love You a Brunch. Or visit us at our website, loveyouabrunch.net. See you next time on Love You a Brunch. I'm Jody Stapler.